Welcome everybody to our webinar today. Uh, we are very happy to have you join us. Uh, our speaker today is Dave Fellman. He's the author of three books and more than 300 published articles on sales, marketing, and management topics. He uh, has delivered keynotes and seminars at hundreds of events across the United States, Canada, England, Ireland, New Zealand, and Australia. And uh, those of you who uh, pay attention to the uh, APDSB website know that Dave has contributed several uh, very useful and well-read articles uh, to that website. So if you'd like to uh, read more of his work afterwards, you're welcome to do that. Um, let me uh, tell you that if you have any questions during today's presentation, uh, if Dave has time, he'll answer them at the end. Uh, so if you have questions, you can use the questions panel on your screen uh, to submit questions. And when Dave is finished, uh, I will read those questions to him and, and he can answer. If we run out of time, though, uh, we will try to get them answered offline and email the, question, the answers to you. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded and it will be uh, presented on, on the APDSP members website uh, shortly after it's finished. So uh, with that introduction now I would like to uh, turn it over to Dave Fellman. Uh, Dave I'm changing the presenter right now. <clears throat> okay, I'm clicking Dave. the show our screen button. There you go. You're up, Dave. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ed, and uh, thank you all for spending part of your day with, uh, with us today. The topic is uh, sales management, hiring, managing, and motivating. And uh, we threw a couple of tricky words in the title, your optimum sales force. Part of what I'm hoping to, uh, to teach today is that uh, there's, there's a such thing as the optimum printing sales DNA. And if we're better at understanding what that is, and if we do a better job hiring people who've got it, we're ultimately going to uh, get better results. By the way, let me uh, offer this thought before we get too deep into the program. I know that, uh, that you sell more than just printing. But uh, yeah, we tend to think of ourselves as printers, I think, and, and I tend to use the word printing to describe the industry that I'm talking about. Um, please don't be offended if I don't include any and all of the other elements of your product line. So I want to start my presentation by sharing with you four fundamental truths, the first of which is if your salespeople knew how to sell more stuff and make more money, they'd probably already be doing both of those things. Second fundamental truth is any skills or knowledge which are necessary for success but not present in your current salesperson, anything that a salesperson needs to know but your salesperson doesn't know, needs to be trained in. Next, any attitudes which are necessary for success but not present in a current salesperson must be motivated in. And finally, sales management is not about managing sales figures. It's about managing sales people and sales processes. And you know, as I was putting this together, it occurred to me that um, there's another fundamental truth that we should be aware of. I was asked to present a, a very similar program a couple of weeks ago to the Printing Industries of America at their uh, President's Conference and for reasons I don't understand, they changed my title and uh, made it something about uh, managing your sales team. And that got me to thinking, all right, salespeople do play on a team, but do they really play as a team? Yeah, you have a, a sales team which maybe includes your salespeople, your CSRs, your production people, but the salespeople themselves are not playing as a team together. So I wanted to offer the point that most of your challenge in improving the performance of a sales team is to improve the performance of individual salespeople. All right, here's a question for you. I'd like you to consider your best salesperson. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you rate that person? 
how happy are you with that person's performance? I'm guessing that if we're talking about your best salesperson, it's a relatively high number. But I also want you to consider, on the same scale of 1 to 10, how do you rate your worst salesperson? And at this point, I'm just hoping that you've got pen and paper and you've got two numbers on the paper right now. One on a scale of 1 to 10 to rate your best and one to rate your worst. We'll come back to that. For now, I want to tell you about the Printing Sales DNA Project, which I initiated um, and completed during the first quarter of uh, 2015. The purpose of this market research study was to identify and quantify the most important skills, attitudes, and personality traits for a successful printing salesperson. I get asked a lot. You know, what should I be looking for in a candidate for a sales position? What, what should my salespeople look like? So I started thinking about those skills, those attitudes, those traits, and I eventually came up with a list of 20, I call them success factors. And in this study, we asked uh, all of our respondents to rate those 20 to try and determine their relative importance. Now, going to come back to that in a moment. The study was open to literally everybody in the industry, owners, managers, salespeople in all segments, quick printing, commercial printing, large format printing, reprographic printing, all kinds of printing. We promoted the study through every outlet, uh, industry publications, associations, franchises. We got pretty heavy play through social media. And again, the respondents were asked to rate the importance, the relative importance of this group of 20 success factors. What we did was ask everybody to rate them on a scale of 1 to 10 in half-point increments. We ended up with 536 usable responses. They came from a very wide range of people and a, and a wide range of printing companies. And if you are interested, I would be happy to send you a free copy of the basic findings report. I'm putting my email address on the screen for those of you who are listening but not watching. It's dmf at davefellman.com. That's dmf, delta, mike, foxtrot, at davefellman.com, d-a-v-e-f-e-l-l-m-a-n.com. We provided a free copy of this uh, basic findings report to every participant. We also put together a uh, detailed findings report. And uh, if you request a free copy of the basic report from me, you'll find that it contains a special offer on the detailed findings report. But I'm going to share some of those findings with you, certainly the most important of those findings with you today anyway. And in order to work my way into that, I need to tell you about the success factors. Here are the 20 success factors that we asked the industry to rate. Energy, which we defined as the willingness to work hard, getting as much done as possible every single day. Creativity, which we defined as the ability to work smart, coming up with solutions to problems and obstacles and objections. Empathy, we define as the ability to accurately and objectively perceive another people's, another person, excuse me, feelings. Sociability was next on the list, an outgoing extroverted personality, in other words, being a people person. Ego drive was next on the list, which we defined as the inner need to get people to say yes, because people with high ego drive get great satisfaction convincing others to agree with them. In this case, to agree to talk, to meet with them, and ultimately to buy from them. Dollar drive. People with high dollar drive are motivated by money. They work hard and smart to maximize their earnings opportunity. Resilience was next on the list. The ability to handle objections and bounce back from rejection. Then, improvement attitude, which I defined as eagerness to learn and willingness to be trained in or managed because better skills and management should produce better results. Courage, the willingness to ask provocative questions and to challenge objections. Presentation skills, the ability to describe the printing company's capabilities and value proposition. Convincing skills, the ability to handle obstacles and objections and close the sale. TMOP skills, time management, organization, prioritization. Next on the list was technical product knowledge. 
general knowledge of the printing companies, of printing processes, excuse me, and specific knowledge of the company's products and services. Applications product knowledge, an understanding of how the printing is used in the customer's business, and the ability to consult and advise on ways to make it work better. Hunter skills, an organized approach to prospecting for new business. A hunter attitude, which I define as a commitment to prospecting for new business. Questioning skills, the ability to lead a sales conversation with questions, both to uncover opportunity and to keep the customer engaged. Listening skills, the ability to uh, hear and understand what the other person is saying. Negotiation skills, the ability to negotiate effectively, resulting in a win-win scenario, not just a price concession. And finally, number 20 was team skills and attitude, the ability and willingness to work well within the team, which includes both the sales side and the production side of the business. All right, so we have these 20 success factors. We asked our respondents to look at the list, and by the way, the definition was right next to the item in the list, so people could see how I was defining each of these terms. And then we asked as, as people were going through the, uh, the exercise, we asked them to rate each of these factors on a scale of 1 to 10 with half point increments. In other words, how important do you think this factor is in determining whether a salesperson is going to be successful or not? I'm putting up a graphic now which shows the, uh, the success factor ratings as an average of all respondents. What it shows is that listening skills was judged to be the most important of these 20 factors. It got a score of 8.89 out of 10. It also shows that uh, ego drive was the least important of these factors, got a score of uh, 7 point two something. Dollar drive, next lowest, 7.63. Creativity was next highest at 8.73. Now, this information, this particular graphic, you'll find this graphic in the um, basic findings report if you request that from me. Again, the email address is dnf at dayfeldman.com. Now I'm going to put up a graphic, though, which compares the average of all respondents to what I think. And... Let me back up a little before I put that uh, graphic up there. One of the things that I'm often asked, as I mentioned earlier, is what does it take to be successful in print sales? What, what are the characteristics, what are the skills, attitudes, personality traits that we should be looking for? One of my observations about our industry is that we are an industry of sales underachievers. I mean, when I ask printing company owners and sales managers to rate their best salesperson on that scale of 1 to 10, um, the answer is not usually 10. And often it's not 9, and sometimes it's not even 8. And when we start talking about the, uh, the worst salespeople, the middle and lower end of the scale, those ratings are considerably lower. I mean, I think if we consider this, even top achievers are underachievers to some degree because everybody could be doing at least a little bit better, a tiny bit better. But my observation about our industry is there's an awful lot of people who aren't anywhere close to the level of performance that, they're, that they should be producing and then sometimes are getting paid for. So that raises a question, why? And as I was considering this before putting the study together, my, my reasoning is, Part of the reason, a big part of the reason why we have so many underachievers is because we hire the wrong people in the first place. I'm going to repeat that. Because we hired the wrong people in the first place. We hire people that are not well suited to the job. So the average of all respondents thinks that listening skills is at the top of the list, ego drive is at the bottom of the list. If you were to look at my feelings, the comparison of all of that to me, what would immediately stick out to you is that one of the factors, I rated two factors as being the most important factors. I gave both of them 9.5 on a scale of 10. One of those was sort of in the middle of the pack for the average of all respondents. That was hunter attitude. And the other one was all the way down at the bottom. 
ego drive. So I'm supposed to be some sort of an expert here. I have consulted with others who are supposed to be experts here. And we think that the results of the study tells us that I was right, that a big part of our problem is that we're hiring the wrong people. We are not hiring people who have the right skills, the right attitudes, the right kind of personality traits to be good at this job. As mentioned, I've often been asked, you know, what should we be looking for in candidates for a sales job? And for the last probably 10 years, I've been answering that question by saying, well, um, I can answer it in two ways. One is more scientific than the other. Here's the less scientific. I look for people who have intelligence, a competitive nature, and an appreciation of the finer things in life. Let's deal with them one at a time. Intelligence. I don't think any of us think that you have to have a PhD in anything to be successful in sales, especially in print sales. But I hope you'll agree that smart people do better than this than not smart people. Or maybe let me use a different term, bright people do better at this than not so bright people. There are things you have to learn, there's product knowledge, there's sales knowledge. In my experience, bright people do better than not so bright people, so I'm looking for people who have that sort of intelligence. A competitive nature, I'm looking for people who like to compete. I'm looking for people, actually, I, I, I've admitted many times, I have a prejudice toward people who've played competitive sports in their lives. Because I find that people who play competitive sports, many of them, most of them, learn the lessons that I've learned through competitive athletics. And the most important thing I've ever learned, and this is going on 60 years now of, of competing in various sports, I learned how to lose. And, and I want to make this clear. I never learned to like losing. That's not what I'm saying. I learned how to lose. And how to lose in sports and how to lose in sales is pretty much exactly the same. What you do is you get up, you give some thought to why you didn't win. You consider whether you need to change your strategy. You consider whether you need to practice and improve your skills. And then you do what you got to do to make yourself better. And then you go looking for an opportunity to compete again. That's the kind of attitude that I'm looking for. And finally, I'm looking for people who have an appreciation of the finer things in life. I um, think that dollar drive is important. I think it's important to look for people who are motivated by their earnings opportunity. But um, I reject the idea that the best salespeople are motivated by money. Here's what I think. I don't think any of us are motivated by money. I think what motivates us is the things that we can do with money. And I'd like you to think about that. Let's get a little deeper into that. It isn't the money itself. It's what you can do with the money. So when I'm interviewing people for sales positions, I'm looking for people who want some of those finer things in life in their lives. I'm, I'm looking for people who want to go to Paris on vacation, not, to, uh, not just to the nearby beach. I'm looking for people who want to drive nice cars. I, I'm looking for people who want nice things in their lives. The more scientific approach, I'm looking for people who have that ego drive, who have that, uh, that need to convince other people to agree with them. By the way, let me share something that I learned in this uh, study. I've done three of these studies. I did the printing sales DNA project, then I did the sign sales DNA project, then I did the office product sales DNA project, and I'm doing similar things in a couple of other industries now. One of the things I learned from the first one, the printing industry study, was that the word ego in this complex, in this uh, phrase, ego drive, the word ego was misunderstood and turned people off. Or at least that's what I suspected. I suspected that part of the reason that people rated ego drive so low had nothing to do with the drive part. It was just people said, yeah, I don't want to have people with huge egos, you know, working in my company. So in the sign sales DNA project and the office product sales DNA project, I changed the term from ego drive to persuasive drive, thinking that, uh, you know, this will take care of the negative connotation of the word ego, except that it turned out that in both of those studies, persuasive drive was rated as the lowest factor in terms of importance. I think it's the most important, 
most of you guys seem to think it's the least important. So next time you're looking for a salesperson, I'm hoping that you'll put greater weight on whether this person has this particular kind of drive. Resilience, the ability to bounce back from rejection, same thing as that competitive nature. Courage, the willingness to ask provocative questions to challenge objections. Empathy, the um, ability to get inside another person's head and understand what they might be thinking. And finally, I go looking for people who, who have a hunter-earner attitude. It's not just a matter of whether they have the skills to do the job, it's, it's whether they want to go out there and hunt and seek out new customers and maximize their earnings opportunity. Those are the things that I'm looking for. Now, how do you identify those key attributes in the candidate and a candidate for your next sales position? It's a combination of things, including your interview process, your reference checking, your psychological testing. Let's start with the third of those, psychological testing. For many years, I've been using a product called Caliper, the Caliper Profile, um, which in fact uses some of the same terminology that, that I have used here. And, and I should admit, I took some of this terminology, ego drive, resilience, courage, empathy, things like that. I took that right from the Caliper profile because the way it's set up, the way it's built, it can actually measure whether a candidate has those attributes. I would never hire a salesperson without putting them through the Caliper profile. Period, end of story. I've often described it as like getting a, a six month look into the future, a look into the crystal ball, um, because it tells you things that, uh, that, that you won't know during the interview stage, but you would know after you've had somebody working for you for six months or so. I can't imagine why anybody would not want to do that before investing six months of paychecks in somebody who may or may not be an underachiever. Now, the Caliper profile is not cheap. It costs $325. Um, it's not the first thing I do with everybody who sends me a resume or an application. It's the last thing that I do as part of the uh, hiring process. But I think it's critically important to use tools that are available to you, and this is a great tool. If you're interested in learning more about Caliper, go to their website, www.caliperonline.com, C-A-L-I-P, E R O N L I N E dot com, and uh, you can establish an account. You can uh, you can use it. You can put a credit card up there and buy a, a Caliper profile for anybody that you want to test. I do want to promote myself just a little bit here, though, and tell you that you can also do the Caliper profile through me. It it costs the same amount of money, three hundred twenty five dollars, but uh, the benefit you might get doing it that way is my experience with Caliper in particular and with hiring salespeople in general. I can help you to interpret the results. Reference checking. I know as well as you do that in today's litigious society, it can be hard to get people to say bad things about uh, one of their former employees, but that doesn't mean that you don't make the effort. Because in my experience, people often will say good things about former employees, which can help you learn things that might help you to make a good hiring decision. And the fact that somebody doesn't want to talk to you about uh, a candidate, somebody used to work for them, I think that tells you something. Finally, the interview process. I believe in a comprehensive interview process. I would never hire a salesperson without conducting a minimum of six interviews. And before you think I'm crazy, I'm not saying that I think you need to interview every candidate six times. I do think you probably want to talk to every candidate three times, though. In my experience, and I do a lot of this helping my clients to hire salespeople, when they send me resumes, I find I am, I'm almost never sure that a candidate is, uh, is qualified to even take to the face-to-face -face interview stage. There's almost always some things I want to know, some questions I want to ask before I make that decision. So a tel telephone pre-interview is almost always part of my process. And then the main interview and then the follow-up interview because it's been my experience that I often think of questions that I wish I'd asked during the first interview and in following up with candidates, they often come up with questions they wish they'd asked 
So the, uh, the second face-to-face -face interview, the third part of this process, gives everybody the opportunity to do that. And then, if I like somebody enough that I'm going to bring them in for this third conversation, I'm going to have them talk to a couple more people on my team. Because I want my people to uh, ask their questions and give me their opinion, and I want the candidate to meet some other people in the organization and learn more about the organization. Please, always understand that on one hand, you're trying to make a good hiring decision. On the other hand, you're trying to help your candidate to make a good career decision because if either party makes a bad decision, it's not going to work out the way you want it to. Finally, interview questions. I don't ask people what they hope to be doing five years from now. I couldn't care less. I don't ask people what they liked and disliked about their last job. Again, I couldn't care less about those things. What I do is I tell people what I'm looking for. I did an interview last week. I told the candidate that I'm looking for somebody who has big time ego drive. Do you know what that means? And he made points with me because he said, no, sir, I don't. He would have lost points if he tried to feed me a load of crap and, uh, and if he did not know and tried to pretend he did. Anyway, I told him what I thought uh, ego drive really meant. We talked about it a little bit. He asked some questions. We came to uh, some consensus. And then, once I was sure that he knew what we were talking about, I said, okay, um, give me some evidence that you've got some, that you've got this ego drive that I'm looking for. Again, this particular candidate got a lot of points from me because he told me a story of a situation that he was in where um, he couldn't give up until he convinced the person to agree with him. And he told me a couple of uh, elements of creativity that he brought to that particular party and, uh, and how he succeeded. And uh, it was exactly the sort of evidence that I was hoping to hear. I've asked similar questions about empathy, about dollar drive. Basically, my interview process is, well, think of it this way. It's an audition. I'm trying to give people an opportunity to show me some evidence that they are the person that I'm looking for. And I take my time, and I don't let any candidates rush me. And I don't let any situations rush me. Another recent situation, the guy told us, he said, I have uh, five job offers now. Um, okay, cool. You have five job offers now. If you have any brains, you'll take the best offer, and we think we have the best offer. And uh, we think that there's more to this process than uh, making a snap decision. Don't let anybody rush you. By the way, don't let anybody rush you, and here's another observation. At the interview stage, there's nobody who is more dangerous to you than somebody who can talk the talk, but either cannot or will not walk the walk. These are the kind of things that we're trying to screen out through the interview process. All right, how do you use this knowledge to improve a current salesperson? Well, the first thing you do is evaluate your current salespeople against the 20 success factors. The next thing you do is you put together an improvement plan, and the improvement plan must include priorities, goals, and benchmarks. I am uh, putting up on the screen now a list of the 20 success factors, and right next to each one of them, I'm putting a number that represents uh, how a particular owner rated a particular salesperson in terms of each of these criteria. This takes us back to my earlier question about uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your best and worst salesperson? What we're doing now is we're taking this to the next level. We're going a little bit deeper. So on the same scale of 1 to 10, how do you rate his or her energy? In this particular case, it was rated an 8. Same scale of 1 to 10, how do you rate this person's creativity? In this case, it was rated a 5. So what we've got is for this individual, we've got scores that range from 5 to 10. And what that tells you is, all right, where is this person strong? But more importantly, where is this person weak? And now that we know where the weaknesses are, we can start thinking specifically about about improvement, about improvement in those areas. Now, another consideration here. 
Um, actually, let me back up a second and pose a question. How do you improve somebody's listening skills if they're weak? How do you improve somebody's presentation skills or convincing skills or hunter skills if they're weak? How do you improve somebody's empathy or sociability or energy? The answer is we haven't got enough time today to talk about that, except for me to say that there are ways to improve any of these things. And here's a suggestion. If you've got a salesperson with, uh, with poor listening skills, go online, go to Google or another search engine and uh, do a search on how do I improve somebody's listening skills. When I did that, I found references to a whole bunch of articles on the topic, um, some of which actually came out of uh, elementary school teaching texts. But the fundamental idea that I wanted to share is there are ways to improve individual skills, attitudes, and to beef up individual personality traits. It takes some creativity maybe, but there are resources out there. All right, back to the individual improvement plan and the elements of it. Um, it's a matter of priorities and goals and benchmarks. And we've got to start with priorities, goals, and benchmarks. So here's a thought. Let's say that you have three salespeople, and each of these salespeople has some strengths and some weaknesses. But let's further say that uh, you don't have all the time that it would take to uh, go to work immediately on all of these weaknesses with all of these people. What I may recommend is that for each of the three people, you pick up either the area that they're weakest in or the area in which some improvement would create the benefit, the greatest return on your investment. And maybe what you say is, okay, person A, I rated him a five in terms of creativity. I'm going to work with him on creativity for the next month with the goal of being able to say that he's a six at the end of the month. And then, depending on what my other priorities are for this person and the rest of the team and the rest of my job, I might spend another month trying to get the person to a seven. Or I might uh, pick a, another area and maybe try to get, get him from a six to an eight in another area that he's a little bit weak. Person number two, again, I'm going to pick one area and I'm going to establish a goal and a timeline and I'm going to work at that and I'm going to see if I can't improve my person's, my salesperson's performance, even if it's only a little bit at a time. I've, I've developed sort of a new motto over the last five or six months. It goes like this, better is better. Think about that, better is better. Sadly, there's not a lot that we can do in terms of snap our fingers solutions to get somebody from being not good at something to being really good at something. But if you recognize the things that they're not so good at and prioritize the things that they're not so good at and allocate your resources wisely, you know, to, to put the time you have available, the resources you have available into the areas that, uh, that would seem to give you the most bang for your buck, better is better. That's the best you could ask for. Now, consider that some of what we're talking about might be skills that would benefit from practice. Some of what we're talking about, some of the areas in which your salespeople are underperformers may be attitude related. And remember what I said earlier, any attitude which is necessary for success when not present needs to be motivated in. That motivation may come as a positive form, a negative form, or more likely some combination of the above. Let's just understand that sometimes an attitude adjustment is absolutely necessary. But let's also understand that uh, compensation can have a significant role to play in attitude adjustment. Here's my fundamental idea on compensation. I believe that money talks. So that raises a fundamental question. What do you want it to say? Here's some possibilities. You might want the money that you're willing to pay a salesperson to say, I want you to generate lots of sales dollars. Alternately, you might want it to say, I want you to generate lots of profit dollars. And I bet you'll agree, those are two different things. 
You might want it to say, I want you to develop new customers. Alternately, you might want it to say, I want you to sell more of our product line to our established customers. You might want it to say, I want you to increase sales year after year. You might want it to say, I want you to work a full day every single day. You might want it to say, I want you to do a good job with the administrative stuff, call reports, expense reports, CRM maintenance. You might want it to say, I want you to work well with the rest of the team. I don't know if these are the things that you want the money to say. You may have other things. Some of these might not be all that important to you, but I hope it gives you a starting point. And I hope it at least plants the idea that money does talk. And you can use the power of the paycheck to motivate specific behaviors. But before we go any further, another fundamental concept. Please, please, please don't ever think that compensation is a substitute for management because it's not. Compensation works best as reinforcement for management. What I'm saying here is you as a manager have a voice. The money has a voice. If you get both voices saying the same thing, now we're really talking. I believe that the ideal compensation plan for a print salesperson will have three components to support both management and motivation. A guaranteed component. When I use that term, I think I'm talking about uh, a salary being one component of the overall plan. An earned component, when I use that term, I think I'm talking about commissions. And an incentive component, when I use that term, I think I'm talking about bonus opportunities. So yeah, what I'm saying is that I think that the ideal compensation plan for your salespeople is going to be a combination of salary commission and bonus to give money its most powerful voice. Now, how do you decide how much you're willing to pay in the first place? This is really a pretty simple equation. Question number one, how much sales volume can I expect? Question number two, how much gross profit will there likely be in that amount of sales volume? Question number three, how much of that am I willing to share with a salesperson? The answer to those three questions or, or that uh, formula gives us what I will refer to as the compensation fund. Let me show you an example. Let's say that we've got a salesperson. We think this year this guy is going to generate a million dollars in sales. Further, knowing what we know about our cost structure, we project that a million dollars in gross sales will generate $30,000 in gross profit. Further, we're willing to share 30% of that, three cents out of every 10, 30 cents out of every dollar with the salesperson. What that gives us is a compensation fund of $90,000. And basically what I'm saying is, we got a salesperson who's gonna do a million dollars, we're willing to pay him $90,000 in return for that level of performance. Please understand this, by the way, I'm not saying that this should be your plan, your numbers. I'm just using round numbers that I think will be easy for us to understand for me to make the points I want to make. Because the next point I want to make is that once you know how much money you're willing to pay, you can start thinking about how to allocate those dollars to give the money the voice that you want it to have. Option one, 9% straight commission based on gross volume. 9% of a million dollars in sales equals $90,000. That's our compensation fund. But the question is, what does the money say? And I think the money says, go out and get orders. It doesn't say anything about profitable orders. All right, option two. Let's make it 30% straight commission based on gross profit. Now, what does the money say? I hope you'll agree that if the salesperson is going to make less commission, if he or she discounts and lowers the price, that provides an incentive to learn how to sell at higher prices. The money says, go out and sell profitably. Now, let's add, uh, let's make it a salary and commission. Let's say $5,000 a month salary plus 3% commission based on gross volume. Again, this formula adds up to $90,000 based on a million dollars in sales. What does the money say? Well, I think it says I'll pay you $5,000 a month whether you sell anything or not. I'm not sure that's the message we want to get across. Option four, the only change here, it's still a relatively high salary, but now we make the commission at least based on gross profit, so I'm willing to pay you $5,000 a month whether you sell anything or not, but I'll pay you more if you sell at profitable prices. Option five, 
Now let's lower the salary to $2,500 a month, which allows us to raise the commission rate to 5% based on gross volume. It also allows us to add four short-term bonus opportunities worth $1,000 each and one full-year bonus opportunity worth $6,000. And I'm going to show you option six, even though all this does is change the commission from gross sales to gross profit. What we got, though, what we got here is a situation where we have lowered the salary as much as we could so that we could increase the commission and bonus opportunities, fundamentally. Here's what I want to do. I want the guaranteed component, in other words, the salary, to be as small as it can possibly be so that the earned component, the incentive component, the commissions of the bonus can be as large as they can possibly be because that's where we get the most motivational muscle. A couple of quick thoughts about bonus opportunities. Um, I suspect that, uh, that from time to time you add new products and you want your salespeople to focus on them for a while, or I suspect that you might have very profitable products that your salespeople are not selling enough of. All right, that's an opportunity for a short-term bonus tied to selling more of that product. Um, referrals. I bet that, uh, that you would love to have your salespeople soliciting referrals from all of their customers, but for some reason, they don't seem to be willing to do that. How about a 30-day bonus program based on getting some number of referrals from your current customers? Again, we're using the voice of the money to reinforce the voice of the management. Um, Short-term behavior opportunities. I have one of my clients uh, recently we had a guy who just uh, was behaving badly. We wanted him to behave better. And telling him that we wanted to behave better was not getting the results that we were looking for. So we basically bribed him. We basically bribed him. We offered him a bonus if he would improve his behavior. And he did. So we took some of the money that we were willing to spend in order to get that, you know, overall million dollars worth of sales, and we applied it to changing a problem behavior. And what that did was create some motivation toward even better behavior. I hope you'll agree that uh, there's some opportunity for creativity here. I hope you'll also agree that uh, Individual compensation plans tend to work best with individual people. All right, let me reinforce that idea with a review of compensation. Number one, money talks. Um, number two, most salespeople need a little bit of both the push and the pull. The push is management. The pull is motivation, compensation. When the voice of the manager and the voice of the compensation plan are saying the same thing, that's what all of this works best. Um, I believe that you are better off sharing volume than profit. I believe very strongly that it's better to pay commissions on gross profit than it is on gross sales. If for no other reason, then it puts some of the salesperson's skin in the game, more of the salesperson's skin in the game, when they want to come to you and say, hey, I could get business from these people if we lower our prices to you know, a, a barely profitable level. Different strokes for different folks. Look, if you've got different individuals, different personalities, different strengths, different weaknesses, different behaviors, I hope that reinforces the idea that a one-size-fits-all compensation plan is probably not going to do what you want it to do. Final thought in terms of compensation, there's more to this than just money. I um, hear a lot these days about how millennials are different. I know a lot of people seem to be struggling with uh, how to deal with the millennial workforce. In my experience, the difference is it's not a millennial thing as much as it is, is a top performer thing and an underachiever thing. I mean, if you go back through through all of the uh, age groups, there have always been people that you could communicate with, always people that you can't. Um, if there is a difference between the millennials and, and, and us boomers, some of us older people, 
Um, what I keep hearing is that boomers, uh, I'm sorry, that millennials want to be more involved in the process, in the whole decision-making process, and the whole strategy creation process. I guess I would say this, it's been my experience that top achievers always wanted to be involved in that. But that just reinforces the idea that there is more to this than just money, whether we're talking about millennials or exes or boomers or whoever we're talking about. All right, closing thought for today, a final thought for today. I hear a lot about uh, micromanagement, overmanagement. I just want to make sure that uh, you understand that in the whole history of the printing industry, nobody has ever died. No salesperson has ever died from getting too much management. But far too many printing salespeople have underachieved or underperformed because they didn't get enough. I think the things that I'm talking about today um, will be reflected by, need to be reflected by you getting more involved in managing your people. And I hope that, uh, that you won't be reluctant to do that. And especially I'm hoping you won't be thinking that, uh, well, gee, you know, great salespeople don't need any management. The fundamental idea here is that we're not talking about great pe salespeople. We're talking about underachievers, and, and they probably need more. Thank you very much, Dave. A very interesting presentation. Uh, I hope that uh, the attendees found it useful. And let me uh, remind you now that if you have any questions, please use the uh, question panel uh, on your screen uh, to submit those questions. And Dave, uh, while we wait to see if anybody submits questions, uh, let me ask one of my own. Uh, you you mentioned the concept uh, of managing millennials, and that that's in your experience is very similar to any age group. Uh, have you had uh, experiences that were maybe different in trying to sell to millennials? Are their interests or, or, or sales techniques that reach them any different from what uh, other groups of customers require? No. Um, with this caveat, um, the the big thing that people tell me about millennials is that you can't get them to meet with you. They want to do everything online. They just want to go back and forth, emails, text, whatever. They don't want to take the time to meet with a salesperson. But as far as long, you know, ever since my beginnings in this business, there have been people that uh, that I couldn't get them to want to meet with me. So whether we're talking about a millennial or an old person, the fundamental idea is, is the same. You've got to give them a good reason to meet with you. You've got to convince them that there is a benefit to them in meeting with you. And sometimes all that takes is, is just to tell them you think that there's reasons that we could get, should get together to meet. If the salesperson is too willing to just accept that, uh, yeah, well, he doesn't want to meet with me, so I'll have to call on somebody else, then we lose. But my preferred strategy is, is to, to, to tell them, this is why I think it's important for us to get together. By the way, there are, there are things that don't need salespeople to be involved in. There's a million things you can buy on Amazon that you, know, you don't need to talk to a salesperson about. But, but if any of us think that, uh, that printing falls into the same category, we're in the wrong business. What we sell is complex. What we sell has lots of options. Um, what we sell is a lot of moving parts. A salesperson can bring real value here. Sometimes you just got to sell that idea. Great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we do have a few questions from the audience now. Uh, let me uh, read the first one, and that is, uh, where is the best place to find potential salespeople? The best place to find potential salespeople is networking. It's talking to friends, neighbors, suppliers, customers, prospects. Talk to everybody you know and, and tell them, um, we are looking for a salesperson. Let me tell you about the opportunity. Let me tell you about the kind of person we think we're looking for. And then, if you know anybody who, uh, who you think would be a good fit, um, give them my name and ask them to call me or give me their name and, and I'll call them. The, the thing about, the thing about uh, advertising for a job is that there's only two reasons that people are looking 
in the advertising sites, and I'm talking about everything from Craigslist to, uh, to, to oh God, I can't even think of Indeed.com is the new one, Monster.com, Career Builder. There's only two reasons that people are looking for a new job. And one is that there's something wrong with the job they got. And the other is that there's something wrong with them. There's an awful lot of underachievers looking for new jobs. What I think is that the person you most want to hire as your next salesperson is not even looking right now. It's somebody who's employed right now, producing, productive right now, um, but also smart enough to, to pay attention if something maybe better comes along. And there's a lot of people who are, there's a lot of good people, a lot of good salespeople who are selling products or services that don't provide the earnings opportunity that we do. Okay, thank you. Dave, uh, next question. What's the best way to convert a salesperson from gross sales to gross profit? It, it can be, well the first thing is you know what you're paying them now based on gross sales and it's a pretty simple calculation to determine what the exact uh, percentage rate, the exact commission would, rate would be to gross profit. For example, in the, in, in the example that I put out there, I'm looking back in my notes to try and get the numbers right here. Um, and it's in here somewhere, it has to be. Here we go. Um, 3% commission based on gross volume, 10% commission based on gross profit, that was options 3 and 4. 9% straight commission versus 30% straight commission um, based on gross profit. That, that was a direct arithmetic calculation. Now, um, that's a little bit complicated by the fact that uh, if you've got somebody who's selling now and not generating much profit for you, um, you may want you may want to load the dice a little bit, load the compensation plan, so that they have to produce more gross profit in order to earn the same amount of money. So maybe you've got somebody that uh, that is selling at low margins and earning 10% right now. So you do the calculation and in order to generate the same margin, the same amount of profit dollars would be 25%. I might reduce that to uh, 22% then. I, I hope I'm making myself clear. The fundamental idea here is that I might adjust the plan so that the salesperson had to do better to make the same amount of money. The key here though, and this is something we all better understand, is that the most dangerous activity in sales management is changing a compensation plan. Hmm. Because salespeople will almost always perceive that as, as you're taking something away from me that I already had. So it does require some thought in it and it probably requires some explanation. Thank you, Dave. That kind of leads into the next question and that is, how long do you give a salesperson to make what you consider acceptable progress? Are we talking about a brand new hire? Um, I don't know. The, the questioner didn't, didn't ask, but let's assume so. Let's assume so. All right. When I, when I make an offer to a candidate for sales position, one of the things I give them is a spreadsheet which illustrates how I expect volume to come in over the first 12 and the second 12 months and how the compensation plan will play out over that same time frame. And it always involves a growth curve. You know, I, I did one the other day that started with $1,000 and we were expecting $1,000 a month in sales in the first month and $30,000 a month by month 12. And then averaging $30,000 a month for the next three months, five more for the next three months, five more for the next three, five more for the next three. All right. So what this gives us is a projection um, 
on on how we think the volume will come in and also it needs to be a, a projection that we'd be happy with you know sometimes you got to invest a little bit more than you want on the front end but but that's why it's so important that you have these um benchmarks um, so you'll know whether whether this person is worth continuing with. A new sales rep is going to need at least six months to show anything even remotely resembling a, a monetary return on investment. But but let's say that I'm I've decided I'm going to be happy with a thousand the first month, three thousand the second month, five thousand the third month or 10, 15, 20, 30, whatever the numbers may be in your case. If the salesperson reaches those benchmarks, then you go on to at least the next month. And if the salesperson doesn't achieve the benchmarks, but you're close, you probably keep going on to the next six months. And if the salesperson isn't quite achieving the benchmarks but is close, but you're happy with the work ethic and the way this person is, is uh, making himself or herself part of the team, th then you keep on going on to the next month. It, you can't say six months and then you make a decision. Actually, I've made decisions in three weeks. Because even though you can't know whether somebody is going to be able to really sell and meet your expectations, you find out pretty quickly whether you want them around. <laughs> so I guess my answer is plan on, my answer is think in terms of at least a six month investment in a new salesperson, but recognize that it can really be a month to month progression. Thank you, Dave. Let's see if we can squeeze in one more question here, and that is, uh, what is the best management software? And I assume the 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 uh, person means the best sales management software. Um. Wow. It, the way I interpret that question is the best uh, CRM software, content I, management, I would say the same. Yeah. management. Um. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, none of them are perfect in my experience. I've been using ACT for 29 years. Um, it's got bloated. It, it's a product. I'd describe it as a product that'll do 100 things, but we only need eight of them. Um, I know people who, who are happy with Salesforce.com. I find Salesforce to be counterintuitive, but maybe that's because I've been using ACT for so many years. Again, none of them are perfect. Some of them are better for big sales forces than small sales forces. But now, this is the answer that I think the, uh, the question was hoping for. If I were starting today, the one I would look at is called One Page CRM. It is a less complex, less bulky product than ACT or Salesforce. Um, it's uh, cloud-based but it allows you to enter data from pretty much any device, uh, uh, something with a little keyboard or something with a big keyboard. Um, from my perspective, considering that none of them are perfect, this one's probably the best. Okay. Well, Dave, thank you very much for this presentation today, and uh, thank you attendees for listening, and uh, definitely hope that you found this useful and hope that you will uh, continue to participate in APDSB member events. Uh, this webinar was recorded and we will be posting it on the members site uh, shortly and uh, you will all get an email when that is posted. But Dave, thank you again very much and uh, this ends today's webinar. Thank, thank you all. You.